there, Matt Jones with Paris Lit Up. We're conducting an interview of the glorious multimedia artist La La Drona. Can you tell us a little bit about your re retrospective project? So my retrospective video series, um, it's a idea I had about, I thought it would be really, really cool to have um, an artist that I really, really liked if I went to a museum exhibition of that artist and saw the artist herself explaining her own work. Uh, whether that be in a hologram or in a video. I just thought that that would be really cool to see that. And so I thought, hey, you know what? I would like to do that as well. I'm gonna start talking about my art and I'm gonna start explaining the inspiration behind each piece. Um, yeah. As Ed noticed in the past, sometimes when you do a live reading or a performance, for example, at the open mic, and we've even seen, I think, at the launch of PLU 6, you performed. That uh, was a great one, as I recall. Um, you, you assume this alter ego, and, and it, to, to, to we uh, muggles, it seems very bizarre. It can be like a person, seem like a person from the future, or a person from another planet, or a robot, or something like that. And then you come in. So can you, can you reflect a little bit on, on why you adapt uh, an alter ego in order to, to perform? Yeah, so I created La La Drona, or perhaps La La Drona created me. I'm not really sure which way it goes, but I thought of this idea of humans, we create gods, perhaps in order to have something to strive to or an objective, and um, r rather than having gods create us. So I thought about this idea of, okay, well, if I had this goddess figure of whom I wanted to be, or this art goddess figure, um, who would that be? And I, I constructed her over the years in my blog based on a fact. Um, I wrote that blog for about 10 years where I took my life, reality, and then I hyperbolized it in order to uh, to fit it into this creative universe that, that I made. And I think that whenever I'm on stage or whenever I'm performing, I channel this goddess figure that I strive to or that eventually I, I, I became. I thought it was like... You, you, you had this other alter ego that you slipped into and this and this gave you a kind of distance to to look at yourself in a kind of objective way and, and to get a, a bit of space there and you're telling me no the transformation is a much more literal thing than that yeah so I I think it started out that way I think I wanted to create some space for myself as as a writer because I, I actually started using the name Lala Drona as a pen name and that was to give myself more creative freedom to not uh, to imagine that i would publish something and then people wouldn't see my name they would see another character i thought that was great it also transferred into the art world and eventually though after years and years you know i always say that destiny is something you can only see in hindsight so whether you believe in destiny or not and it's just all these patterns came to light that made me feel that Okay, yeah, La La Drona was always there whispering in my ear, go this way, go that way, pick up this, like, pick up this pencil, pick up this paintbrush. Lala, I remember a few years back you did a, a showing of your artwork at an atelier here in Paris, and, and the artwork, there, there was a number of, of pictures, photos, uh, paintings, all which featured the female body being stared at and or invaded by these like vaguely masculine, but very much like I focused what I called at the time view bots. Can you expand this idea of the view bot and how that impacts your art a little bit? Yeah, uh, that was the exhibition uh, Power of the Click. Uh, yeah, I remember I remember seeing you there. That was really that was really cool. Thanks for coming and, and looking at and, and, and seeing everything. That was cool to have you there. Well, like, um, the ViewBots, I remember that. The ViewBots, I call them drones. They're, in my work, they're the virtual or digital masses. That's who they, that's who they represent. And so it's these masses of people online who are looking at the body. And it's just this idea of always being watched and, and things I think we feel more and more and more as, as time goes on with the internet and surveillance and even policing each other. One of the photos I think that you sent me before this meeting, which I, I'm not sure if it was related to Power of the Click or if it was a, another thing that you're working on, but it was two female faces side by side, uh, both 
resemble dew in the face, and the rest of the body was composed basically of wedged in view bots slash drones. So after seeing that, 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 that painting, my thought was, to what degree do you feel that we construct ourselves based on this external gaze? That's a good question. I think, I think that there's a, a lot of my work, it deals with transitions and, and specifically these transitions between the virtual and the real and how they influence one another. I like to look at, okay, uh, something as simple as you put something online, how many people like it, does that influence your behavior in real life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, same with, even with art, I think that something so pure in us can change dependent on how many likes or follows that we get. And I think that people are getting too comfortable with being liked. I think people are getting too comfortable with um, making art or making or having behaviors that look good in a box. I, and so I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but as far as the piece e goddesses go, um, it was the digital masses that, that created these two e-goddesses um, so yeah and I just thought of it as these these two different it's it's my um, exploration of the the laugh as well right now I'm exploring a little bit more into the laugh the different natures of the laugh so the maniacal nature of the laugh um, happiness um, all these different emotions that can come out simply through a laugh and so they were just these two different faces different types of laughs I think the stuff about the laugh is super interesting. I'm happy to hear any more thoughts you have about that. I'm, I'm also, like, we've become very critical of, of social media in our in our time and the way that it, that it shapes us and guides our behavior. And I think specifically Instagram because it's so visual and it, and it requires us to be, like, constantly going and doing things. You know, if we wanted, we could walk 20 feet over this way and, and, and do the interview with a statue behind us or a fountain behind us or something like that. And Instagram, I think, if, if you're the kind of person who's constantly producing content, you gotta constantly go to those things that appear epic in order to, to film yourself in front of it. So my, my question to you is, is trying to lead an Instagrammable life like a shortcut to actually leading a better, more interesting life? Uh, I, I would say no. I think that if you're just going places in order to take a picture of yourself, that means you're never actually going anywhere. You're, you're just constantly thinking about the perception of yourself and how other people are perceiving you and impressing other people, um, but you're not really taking in that place fully. And I think that that's a really big problem today. And I also think that it, it's also problematic that we're making, I guess coming back to the art thing again is, um, I think that there are museums and there are galleries and uh, all kinds of exhibitions that want the art to be Instagrammable. And people go there to take a picture in front of it. Um, it's whatever creates the biggest buzz. And I think that that's interesting, um, just like bright colors. Bright colors are interesting because they attract you. However, bright colors also hurt your eyes just slightly. So you can't really look at it for very, for very long. And that's actually why I use gray. The color gray is because it's my way of rejecting this kind of uh, snackable content or the snackable art that we're creating. A snackable life, a, snack, a snackable life, I guess. We talked a little bit about the, the different extremes of artists. The one type of artist on one end being like the absolute sellout who does everything for cash and the other extreme artist being the, the martyr who lives on the mountain and refuses to compromise at all and, and is completely unsacrificing about their art for the, for the caliber of the art. Can you talk a little bit about these extremes, where you place yourself within this system, and about the exterior systems that you see that take advantage of our creativity? Wow, that's a, that's a loaded question. Uh, well, I guess it, go, it goes with my use of gray and the gray scale is that I don't really want to stay on either side of any extreme anyway, and I, I believe that we're always you know, traveling on that scale at all moments. I, I don't think it's healthy and I think it's problematic to, to stay in one or the other. I think there's never one format that works over an entire life. I think we have to change formats. 
dependent on our context or our, our environment. But where do I place myself at this moment? Ask me in 10 years, but at this moment, I'm definitely someone who I prefer to keep my art for, I, 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 I want to keep my art pure. And I think the way to do that for me, from my experience in the past, is to not depend on my art for my financial support. I think that it's very dangerous to do that because then you start listening to exterior systems who want to make money. They tell you, oh, we like this, but uh, our clients want it in blue. Or um, you just, and same with, it's the same thing with Instagram. It's the same thing. It's, it's like you want to start to make people happy. And if you, if you really rely on it to survive, then you're really only going to create things to make other people happy. That's okay too, it's just, it's not my way of doing things. I have so much inside that I wanna express, so much that I'm taking in and absorbing that I wanna express, that I, I haven't had this need to really make anyone else happy with my art. Well, if, Lala, if, if, if you're not trying to make people happy with your art, what is your art for? Wow, that, okay. Drop the mic. Matt Jones, right there. That's the million dollar question. Um, I think that, I would say that that goes into why are you an artist? So why am I an artist? If it, the younger version of me would say, oh, I don't have another choice. That's why I'm an artist. I, I do it because I don't have, I can't do anything else, but that's not true. I think, I think everyone can do something else. There's a way. Um, I think that that's, I think the more mature, and thought about, I mean, I think the, I do art because for me, art or creating art is a, re, a rejection from our presented reality. I think anytime somebody takes a moment and even keeps a notebook and writes down their ideas, I think we live in a society that doesn't want us to think. And so anytime, and, and art isn't, let's say, typically valued unless you're in that 1%. So if you're somebody who's creating, writing, um, you know, doodling even, you're already rejecting your presented reality and what's valued in our system. So for me, that's what art is. Lala, is there any messages that you want to give to your fans who might be tuning in today? Uh, yeah. I would say, first of all, don't be a fanatic of anything. And second of all, I guess keep creating, like I said before, even just keep a, a, a notebook of your own ideas, of your own thoughts. You don't have to even make anything if you don't want to. But I think noticing the small things in life too and what's important to you and what you notice and, and documenting those things is really important. And I heard a quote today actually that was really beautiful. It was, if we only listen to all the quote unquote talented birds in the jungle, then the jungle would be a very quiet place. And it, it made me think of all these people who don't think that they're good enough or talented enough. Well, I think that that's our perceived of what our perception of what talent is, but beauty for me is really found in the fringes of everything. 